So if you see someone reaching over and press it for you, that's what that's about. So uh, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Purdue University Serious Security Seminar Series. Uh, today is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Ravi Sandhu from George Mason University. Uh, Professor Sandhu earned his bachelor and uh, master's degree from uh, IIT Bombay and Delhi, respectively, and his master's and PhD degrees from Rutgers University. He's a fellow of ACM and IEEE, and he was the recipient of the IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award. Uh, his research has focused on information security, privacy, and trust, with special emphasis on models, protocols, and mechanisms. His doctoral work on safety and expressive power of access control was further developed by him, culminating in the type access matrix in 1992. Uh, in collaboration with Professor Jojodia, he analyzed and reconciled confidentiality and integrity in multi-level secure databases. In 1993, he showed that the uh, Chinese wall uh, uh, separation of duty policies were instances of information flow. Uh, in 1996, uh, along with industry colleagues, he published a seminal paper on role-based access control. Uh, which evolved into the 2004 uh, NIST-NC standard uh, RBAC model. Uh, in 2002, with his student, uh, he introduced the usage control model for next generation access. Uh, Ravi has published over 160 technical papers on information security <coughs> and has received over 30 research grants and has graduated 12 PhD in its career. Uh, Ravi is the founding editor of the Synergy Lecture Series on Information Security, Privacy, and Trust. Earlier, he was the founding editor-in-chief of the ACN Transactions on Inter uh, Information and System Security, TSEC, uh, from 1997 to 2004. Uh, he was a chairman of ACN SIGSAC from uh, 1995 to 2003, and founded and led the ACN CCS and ACN SECMAC conferences to high reputation uh, and prestige. Uh, Ravi is also an, an inventor on uh, eight security techni uh, technology patents, and he has over 15 patents pending. Uh, he's also the principal architect of the master and PhD programs in information security and assurance at George Mason University. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Sandu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Donghyan, first of all, for uh, arranging this visit and for this very nice uh, introduction. It's been a busy day. I've met a lot of uh, people, some old friends and some new friends, I hope. And uh, it's been uh, interesting, and I hope uh, we can conclude with an interesting lecture. So this, um, uh, really, there are three themes that uh, kind of bring together in this uh, line of work. The first one is a security problem that uh, we can call secure information sharing. I'm going to abbreviate it as IS in uh, some of the forthcoming slides. Uh, I guess the secure part of it is uh, assumed. Uh, <laughs> why would you want to do it if it's not secure? And uh, uh, in the DOD, it's uh, also known as assured information sharing somehow. Uh, that's a preferred term in the DoD community. And it's a very simple problem uh, to describe. Uh, there are two quotes here, uh, share but protect. So you need to share information, but you also need to protect it. And that's really, uh, you know, from the very beginning of uh, computer security, that's been, uh, it was at the root of discretionary access control, if you will. And uh, in that sense, it's the mother of all security problems. So, uh, we will speak more about it uh, in a moment. There is this uh, second theme of trusted computing, which I will be abbreviating as TC as we go along. Uh, this is a technology which has been developed by many of the big players in the computer industry, uh, Intel, HP, Microsoft, IBM, 
to name a few, uh, and a whole lot of other participants. Uh, it tries to address the problem of securing your keys. We can encrypt stuff on the client machine or on a server machine, but what do we do with the encryption keys? Now we can encrypt those again, but what do we do with those encryption keys? So very soon you realize there's a you know, basic problem here. And trusted computing, one aspect of it is the trusted platform module, which says uh, the root keys, eventually you've got to sort of end this chain somewhere, and the root keys in that chain will be protected in a separate processor called the trusted platform module. So you will have some level of hardware protection as opposed to just software protection for it. And the second aspect of trusted computing says that uh, not only will we protect the keys, but we'll also increase the level of uh, memory protection and so on currently provided on uh, CPUs. For example, this is just one example of the things that they have uh, tried to fix in trusted computing. Uh, direct memory access allows uh, device drivers to pretty much write to any area of memory. Memory protection is turned off for direct memory access. And we all know that direct memory access is a requirement to do I.O. efficiently. So uh, they have injected uh, some degree of memory protection uh, so that DMA cannot bypass it. And that's just one example of the kind of problem they have tried to fix uh, in uh, existing uh, architecture. So that's trusted computing. It is something that's kind of driven by industry. There's been very little uh, academic uh, involvement with it. And so it's a little bit unfamiliar to uh, most, academ uh, most of academia. And uh, nevertheless, it's an important industry initiative. And it tries to bring together cryptographic techniques and access control techniques to solve a real world problem of uh, trying to secure stuff on a machine. And then the third uh, theme is that of uh, uh, a way of thinking about security problems. Uh, there are two aspects to it. There's a layered approach of thinking in terms of policy, enforcement, and implementation layers, and I will talk about that uh, during the talk. And then there's a new kind of way of thinking about access control, which we call usage control. Uh, which was published uh, starting 2002, but the journal paper appeared 2004. So it's a relatively recent uh, effort. Both of these things have come out of uh, my group at uh, GMU. So this talk is going to try and bring all these three things together in some uh, way. Of course, each of these three would be of interest by itself, uh, even without the other two. But here we are trying to bring all three together. Uh, and it is a work in progress. So, uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, quick overview of what is trusted computing. Uh, well, the first uh, uh, statement is that you cannot uh, achieve uh, assurance uh, using software alone. You have to have some hardware mechanisms on which uh, you base uh, your uh, security and assurance. Okay, at the sort of very simple level, you have to have sort of two user two modes of execution, a kernel mode and a user mode. Otherwise, the user mode can, you cannot protect the kernel from the user mode. So uh, that's, that's just one manifestation of this principle. And uh, certainly this uh, desire to provide assurance for computing on a, a platform goes back a long way. Uh, the moment uh, we had more than one user executing or more than one program executing on a computer, we had this need. Uh, to make sure they don't uh, interfere with each other. And we've had a long history of technology in this arena, and I'm not even going to try and summarize it. Uh, in some sense, it culminated in the Orange Book, uh, which tried to uh, you know, inject military-style uh, military labels and focus on confidentiality as the main objective. So I'm not going to review that here. I just assume uh, people have some background in that area. And uh, what's new about uh, trusted computing today is the uh, uh, going back, injecting cryptography as an essential element and a foundation for security, which the Orange Book did not do. The Orange Book uh, did not directly do it. Okay, it, it did not rule out the use of cryptographic techniques, but it didn't use cryptography as a foundational element. And uh, 
providing protocols to establish trust within a platform. So you, it's, not, it's not only enough to secure your keys so that uh, they cannot be accessed in clear text by uh, malicious software. Uh, you also need to make sure that they are usable only by approved software. And that's a very important uh, insight that, okay, you can protect the keys, but if the keys can be used in the protected container by uh, improper software, then the malicious software can use your keys. So uh, just protecting the clear text key is not enough. You have to protect who uses the key. And uh, trusted, uh, the TPM provides the mechanisms for uh, ensuring that the key is used only by an approved application. And it does that by computing hash chains and stuff like that. And I'm not going to get into the details of the trusted computing aspects because those are well known and well published. You can uh, certainly uh, look at trusted computing group and you'll get tons of literature on, uh, on how they, they're doing this. It's a standard. There's nothing hidden about it. And uh, I will uh, point this out that in the Orange Book philosophy, the whole idea is to eliminate trust from the application, do everything in the kernel of the operating system, no need to trust any application. And, uh, you know, that idea didn't fly. And I believe it didn't fly because fundamentally you cannot escape from putting trust in the application. It's just a silly thing to be even trying to do because uh, the application is the only one who really knows uh, what it is that is being protected. And you cannot protect it only at the level of bits and bytes. You have to protect things at uh, sort of the layer of abstraction that only applications can provide you. Okay? So I believe it was a fundamentally mistaken approach and uh, modern trusted computing goes completely to the other direction and says our real problem is to sort of uh, make sure that only trusted applications can get the keys which enable access to uh, content. Okay? That's really the essence of this uh, approach. Uh, so, uh, by making sure that only approved applications can access the content, you are then relying on the application not to do uh, leakage of uh, data. And you want to make sure that the application can run confined so that other software on the machine which is simultaneously running, concurrently running, cannot grab that data. And that you do by increasing the uh, strength and quality of your memory protection. So again, all of this is, uh, there's, there's nothing that we have contributed here. This technology has come out of uh, Intel, HP, IBM, uh, Microsoft, etc. So the question for us is how do we use this? And basically, uh, that's uh, the project that we've been working on. It's funded by Intel, so you can appreciate that they have uh, some uh, interest in this technology. Uh, so what is information sharing? Uh, again, uh, described very quickly, it's share but protect. And fundamentally, it requires some controls on the client side. You cannot achieve it entirely by controls on the server side. Because at the server, you can decide whether or not I serve up the information to you. But once it is available on the client, I have to extend my controls onto the client. Otherwise, the information is then uh, completely uh, uh, unprotected, all right? So in order to achieve effective security in an information sharing uh, uh, context, we have to have controls on the client. That's just a given. And those controls uh, would presumably be based on this trusted computing technology because that's what the vendors are putting out, okay? And uh, certainly, uh, you know, we will see information sharing is a very big problem and it includes uh, retail digital rights management. So if I sell you some music, I want you to play it on your computer, but not uh, for it to escape from your computer onto some uh, file sharing network, okay? So that's been a sort of major uh, driver of this uh, line of work. And uh, people have sort of even equated trusted computing to retail DRM, but uh, that's not uh, uh, scientifically a good way of thinking about it. And then, uh, so let me just, uh, you know, it, it's bigger than digital rights management. We tried to sort of uh, classify this information sharing problem. And if you think about it a little bit, you very soon realize that this is a really big thing. There are many, many uh, different aspects to it. And 
I'm not going to go over these two slides. They are from uh, this paper that is uh, quoted here. Uh, so it's about 2004, two-year-old paper. This was an attempt to try to classify this problem domain, but really, uh, and uh, you just have to take it uh, for granted. I don't. We don't have the time to kind of go through this uh, uh, space, but this is just too big a space to even. So it's it's like you know you haven't even gotten an understanding of the first few elements, and you're trying to draw up the periodic table, and you, you, it's it's near, you know, it's not going to happen. You need you need to be at a much more mature stage of uh, your uh, science and discipline to be do to be able to do that. So so how do we make progress in this area? given that it's sort of premature for us to try and characterize the uh, space uh, even uh, uh, semi-completely, let alone fully completely. So the approach we have taken is to look for some sweet spots, you know, find some areas where, uh, you know, our, uh, if, if we define the problem as saying, how do we apply trusted computing to information sharing, then maybe we can find an appropriate uh, piece of information sharing that, um, for which trusted computing is relevant. And maybe we can find usage control as a useful way of thinking about it and the pie layers as a useful way of thinking about it. So we've taken a kind of pragmatic approach to this, uh, not trying to boil the ocean, but looking at uh, a specific problem. Now, when you look at classical approaches to information sharing, certainly discretionary access control tried to solve this problem. It says, if I create a file, I am the owner and I determine who can read the file. And yes, I determine not only can you read it, but can you provide the read access to other people and so on. And this is a well-known uh, sort of aspect of discretionary access control. Unfortunately, it's a fundamentally broken idea because once you can read the file, you have the capability to copy it. And maybe you don't have uh, the ability to grant access to the original file, but to the copy, you have complete control as to who can access it. So you can distribute the copy freely. So, uh, you know, this sort of copy problem uh, sort of kills discretionary access control, and that's been well known. It's not, I'm not observing this as anything new. This was known back in 1971 when uh, mandatory access control was invented uh, to precisely address this uh, weakness of uh, discretionary access control. And uh, it was very early recognized that the problem is not so much with the end human users, even if you trust them not to violate the discretionary access control uh, uh, intent. Uh, there are Trojan horses, there's malicious software that can do it uh, without their knowledge or uh, cooperation. And uh, anyone who has a Windows machine today uh, has lived with, uh, I mean, if you, if you thought Trojan horses are a figment of the imagination, uh, you may want to examine your PC when you get back to your <laughs> desk. I mean, we have to scan these things day and night to make sure uh, they aren't infected, right? So the problem of malware is uh, uh, certainly uh, known to the average uh, consumer today. So, okay, mandatory access control was supposed to solve this problem for us. However, mandatory access control can only do a coarse-grained kind of solution by slapping on top secret, secret, unclassified, confidential labels on information and controlling information flow at that level of granularity. Uh, and even there, there are all kinds of problems with covert channels and so on. So it's not that easy to do. And uh, certainly it doesn't scale up. If you want to do this uh, very fine-grained, you want uh, the document to be accessible only by an ad hoc uh, collection of people rather than by everyone who is labeled top secret, uh, you will get a real super explo explosion of security labels, and that's uh, not friendly. And so their standard solution has been, okay, you know, you keep it for the big level stuff like top secret, secret, classified, uh, confidential, and so on, and for the fine-grained stuff, you use DAC. But, by the way, DAC does nothing for you. So, I mean, you know, you haven't... <laughs> it's kind of... Uh, not really solving the problem by saying we'll fall back to DAC. That doesn't solve anything for you. There was an attempt made, uh, and we are actually seeing some of this, uh, these ideas being resurrected under the uh, uh, name of accountability uh, to the, these days. But the idea of originator control was, okay, you know, why can't I apply, uh, I, I will allow information to be copied from one file to another, but if you copy it, I'm going to kind of propagate the access control lists so that uh, the access control list on the copy will reflect 
the access control list on the original, and now I'll start enforcing these additional controls. So the approach taken there was, let copying happen, but we'll keep track of what controls we need to enforce on the copies. Okay, and I don't think anyone actually ever tried to implement this, but this was uh, proposed. The uh, modern uh, trusted computing approach uh, actually says, let's try to prevent copying from happening. Basically, that's what it boils down to saying. It says, I'm going to give you this information, and I'm going to let you open it in a very, very confined environment, and only a trusted application will be able to see it, and uh, we will rely on the trusted computing mechanisms on your client machine to make sure that no other software can sneakily uh, get that information. And we have to rely on the uh, trusted uh, viewer to kind of uh, not be... Uh, uh, cooperating in trying to leak that information out. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a different uh, kind of style of enforcement. And uh, that's really what trusted computing was invented for. So can that be used? Uh, so that's the modern approach uh, to uh, 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 this information sharing problem. And it uses a mix of cryptographic and access control techniques. It's, it's very foundation. Trusted computing technology provides you security for your root keys, so they never have to escape the environment of the TPM chip. But it also provides you controls on who can actually use these keys. That's an access control kind of control. It's not a, uh, uh, just a question of whether it is clear text or plain text. Even in this protected environment, only approved applications can use the key. And moreover, uh, there are enhancements in uh, memory protection technology that I uh, already mentioned. So there is a mix of crypto cryptographic and access control techniques. And I find this interesting because, you know, these two communities have kind of, uh, there's been a little bit of synergy. Cryptographic techniques have been used for access control hierarchies and things like that. And, you know, Mike has done some very good work in that area with his students. But... Uh, this is a sort of uh, recognition that you really need some synergy between these two approaches because they are fundamentally solving different problems, but you need to solve both of them. And, um, you know, at the very uh, foundational level, you have to ensure that your trusted viewers is unable to see the content in clear text unless it has the ability to access the correct keys to decrypt that content. But... Coupled with that fact, we want to inject access control uh, to get us a degree of policy flexibility and policy mechanism separation, both of which are very important uh, requirements in any practical system. Uh, you need to have policy flexibility. Even if you're interested in only one specific policy as a vendor, you want to have a platform that has policy flexibility so that if your customer changes, if you have different customers with different uh, policy needs, you can meet all their requirements from a single platform. Okay? So uh, that's, imp that's an important uh, requirement. And uh, if you try to embed all your policy into cryptographic mechanisms, you get a very tight coupling between policy and mechanism. So if your policies change, you kind of have to change your entire cryptographic scheme. And uh, even if you're able to do that on the fly, it's kind of hard. How are you going to go get it deployed on all these platforms? And by the way, we are talking about platforms in tens of millions, hundreds of millions, that kind of scale. So it's not going to be easy to do policy mechanism separation unless you have it built in. And access control mechanisms provide you sort of a natural way to do uh, policy mechanism separation. So the first insight is that the trusted viewer will not allow you access to the plain text unless you have access to the correct key. And the second insight is that even with access to the correct key, the trusted viewer, well, it's trusted, it's going to enforce policy. So it could show you the content, but it might decide not to show you the content. Okay, And that's where access control kicks in. So uh, our goal here is to try to mm. s sort of marry these three things, uh, these two uh, ideas uh, uh, together. So now I'm coming to this uh, three-layer framework that I talked about. So in, in addressing this problem, uh, we found this uh, sort of decomposition of the problem space to be very useful. Uh, it's really five layers. 
but the topmost layer is very informal. The uh, real engineering is done in the three layers uh, sandwiched in between, the policy enforcement and implementation layers, which I will be talking about in a moment. And then your target platform is uh, the technology that we talked about. Okay, If you had a different target platform, you could specify that too. But here we are fixing the target platform to be trusted computing. And uh, what you do at the topmost layer, which we call the objective layer, you have to scope the problem. So we have scoped the information sharing problem in a very, very narrow but interesting uh, uh, case. This is by no means the most general form of information sharing. In fact, it's a very tiny piece of the overall information sharing problem. We are looking at the read-only case. So you get documents, you don't modify them, and then further disseminate them. Okay, It's a sort of one-way dissemination. We are talking about document level controls versus query level control. So uh, you either have access to the document or not. The access is not really dependent on the content of the document. That's the point that this uh, bullet tries to make. Uh, the third one is super distribution. I don't want to have to encrypt the document differently for every recipient. I want to do the encryption once and uh, follow this uh, access wherever authorized. So encrypt once, access wherever authorized. There are other schemes in which the content has to be differently encrypted for each uh, recipient. And there's a fair amount of literature in the trusted computing uh, uh, arena which follows that line of thinking. Because if I encrypt differently for each machine, uh, uh, then I know it can only be opened on that particular machine. Okay, uh, And uh, the protocols for doing that are uh, discussed in the literature, but there's less discussion of how to support super distribution where you encrypt only once, and if you happen to be at an authorized machine, you can actually access it. And then uh, finally, to have some support for online access, excuse me, offline access. So if you're required to be online every time you do access, the benefit is that you can go to some central place and make some kind of policy check and get some updated information. This is especially important if you're doing revocation and you want the effect of the revocation to take place immediately. You need to refresh your policy uh, on every access. So, uh, you know, uh, be, that's not... Uh, uh, an acceptable usage model. So uh, we need to have some access for offline support. So that's our definition of the problem. And this is something you need to think of at the topmost objective layer. But we also need to scope the solution. And we have already scoped the solution by saying we are going to be using trusted computing technology. Okay. So we fixed the sort of bottom layer of technology. But now we are going to take this two-phased approach that this uh, super distribution will work but it will work only within a group of machines. It's not going to work across all possible machines that are TPM equipped. It is uh, given a current uh, definition of the TPM. If you think about it, maybe that's not a problem that's easy to solve. Okay, But the TPM technology as it exists today doesn't solve it. Okay, It's not possible for me to encrypt once and uh, 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 sort of use wherever authorized, view wherever authorized, without having continuous online access. Okay, so you know this is uh, the, the the solution space that we are looking at. You have to have the ability to enroll a machine into that group, and then we can do super distribution within that group of machines. And within that group, we can impose additional finer grained controls if we like. So that's a decision that we have made at the objective layer. And uh, basically, I have just said this, that this uh, aspect is required to support super distribution. And then we get uh, the ability to support fine-grained access and policy mechanism uh, separation. And once we allow any degree of offline access, you have to accept that you are going to not have completely instant and immediate revocation. It's not going to happen, because uh, there is a period of offline access when uh, the revocation information may be out of date, all right? Because unless you're updating all the time, uh, you're not going to have the most uh, up-to-date. There's going to be some window of uh, delay and lag in your revocation. 
but these are just consequences of the more important decisions that have been imposed or have been uh, 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 sort of laid out as constraints on the problem. Uh, we have to, there's no free lunch. We have to pay a price for some of these uh, decisions. So I'm going to look at the policy models and I'm going to go over these uh, slides fairly quickly. Uh, so here, uh, looking at the various states of a member in a group. So a, a member is a machine, uh, which is presumably tied to a user. So you either ne you start off by never having been a member of the group, then you become a member, and then maybe you leave the group, and possibly rejoin. So that's sort of the the life cycle, and you know this sort of joining and leaving a group arises many times in uh, security situations uh, one uh, common example is in uh, multicast groups which has been uh, fairly well studied in the literature but here the characteristics of these groups are a little bit more uh, a little bit different and a little bit less well defined so in the first state there is no problem if you have never been a member of the group you get no access and that's the end of it but in this state, what does it mean? While you're currently in the group, do you get access only to those documents that were made available after your joining time? Do you get access to the entire set of documents that were made available to the group from day one? Uh, and are there any additional restrictions? Okay. So we have some policy choices here. It's not completely clear cut as to which one of these uh, uh, we, we should support, okay? In fact, we should be able to support all of these in a, in a desirable implementation. What happens when you leave the group? Do you retain some access? Do you lose all your access? Do you continue to have access to documents that, you, that were made available during your membership? Okay, so you have to answer these questions. And uh, the point of the policy model layer is to uh, settle these questions. And what happens when you rejoin, okay? Do we disallow that? Uh, uh, you know, if you're allowed only access to documents after you joined, what does that mean? Does that include my previous pre period of membership or only this period of membership? So we need to clarify at the policy model layer uh, what the answers to these questions are. And it is true that, at, you know, you don't want to sort of escalate all these questions to the objective layer for decision making. Some of these you may decide to just handle locally, and others you may need to escalate back to the objective layer to reconcile. So this is just a way of trying to address this systematically. Uh, these use cases, I'm not going to go through them, but basically they are illustrating uh, various combinations of policies that you can impose in these states are all, uh, you know, you, you can come up with reasonable use cases for all of them. Okay, so just take my word for that. And then there's a similar question when you ask what happens to a document. When a document is put into a group, well, a document can be removed from the group. And then maybe it can get re-added to the group. So you kind of have a similar set of questions. Again, I'm not going to uh, sort of step through these uh, systematically. But the point is, at the policy model layer, these are the kind of questions that we need to be worried about. And we don't need to start thinking about how we are going to do this. The bigger question is, what is it that we are trying to do? Let's try to understand that. And in order to focus on the what it is we are trying to do, the approach we have suggested is to forget about revocation. All right? This is one uh, lesson that anyone who's been involved with access control learns and relearns many times in their lives and forgets many times in their lives, that revocation is sort of the uh, you know, stumbling block until the point where you worry about revocation, everything looks nice and pretty, and then you bring revocation into the picture, and suddenly you have certificate revocation lists, and you have all kinds of mess to deal with, okay? So let's not worry about it. Let's just assume that somehow, magically, revocation will happen instantly and preemptively. Instantly means it will take effect immediately. Preemptively means if you're in the middle of doing an access and I revoke your membership in the group, boom, you're gone, okay? So that's preemptive. And we will worry about how to approximate this because we know in practice it's going to be impossible for us to actually implement this. But let's focus on the real policies of the real policy questions of the problem and just abstract away, put this revocation issue on the side and deal with it uh, later. Okay? 
So that's our uh, approach. And um, uh, let me, uh, okay, so, you know, we, in, in, in order to do this, we assume there are group administrators who will enroll and disenroll members and add and remove documents. And then we come up with some specific policies for these various states that we have shown. Members can only access documents created after they joined a group. And once you leave the group, you can access documents created during the period of your membership. This is just a specific case of the policy uh, combinations that I uh, talked about earlier. And, uh, you know, uh, we would like to uh, come up with models where these kinds of policies are enforced in relatively well-defined places so that I, if I change the policy, I know exactly where to go and change the enforcement or implementation, okay? Now, the final uh, piece of the uh, picture I'm going to present is the Yukon model. The Yukon model takes a more sophisticated approach to access control than the traditional access matrix model. The access matrix model simply shows you authorization and it shows you a sort of, if you have the ability to read a file, how many times can you read it? Can you read it today, tomorrow? So it doesn't really, the, the, the notion of consumable rights was present in some of the early literature on uh, access control, but it kind of disappeared over time because uh, perhaps people didn't find it useful, perhaps people found it too complicated. But it has come back again, especially uh, sort of when the DRM activity picked up. I may want you to be able to read this document five times, but not 20 times. And, you know, I, I want to sort of put some kind of uh, limitations on uh, how often or how uh, frequently you might be able to do some things. All right? So that's sort of intrinsic to the usage control idea. And there is a notion of authorization, obligation, and conditions and attribute based and so rather than trying to walk you through the usage control model I'm just going to go through my examples and applying it to information sharing and I'll develop the ideas as I go along okay so at the policy layer the operations that we need to uh, model are adding removing a member from a group adding removing a document from a group and then the fundamental the operation that we are really after is uh, a user trying to read a document. Okay, that's the one that is the central uh, operation. And we are going to maintain some attributes of uh, members and we're going to maintain some attributes of documents. So the member attribute tells you whether you're a member of the group or not. The time, uh, the join timestamp tells you when you joined the group, the leave timestamp, excuse me, leave timestamp tells you when you left the group. And likewise for documents, we have these. Uh, 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 attributes and uh, basically in order to sort of track the life history of a member initially all these attributes are null when you are enrolled into the group by a group administrator uh, the attributes change as indicated you are marked as being a member of the group and your joint timestamp is assigned a value your leave timestamp is still null when you are disenrolled from the group your membership attribute becomes false but your join and leave, uh, your, your leave timestamp is added and your join live timestamp is left unchanged, okay? So uh, uh, if you rejoin the group, you come back to this stage. And in terms of the usage control model, we are really doing attribute-based access control here. And we are um, changing these attributes. That is the crucial thing. Uh, the enroll operation actually changes the attributes. The disenroll, it changes the attributes. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we can uh, come up with a similar uh, uh, sort of, uh, we, we are really trying to model this state diagram using these attributes, if you will. Now, uh, the only operation I'm going to show you sort of stated in the Yukon model is the document read. And uh, uh, I'm not going to show you the enroll, disenroll, and the add, uh, remove, because uh, we really don't have time for that. But here is the flavor of what the usage control model can do for you. It's saying, OK, here is a subject who's trying to read this object. Okay, That's the operation that is being attempted. And 
whether this operation is allowed is going to be determined by attributes of the subject and object. And the attributes I'm going to check are that, well, your membership status in the group is defined. It can't be null. All right? So you are either in state two or state three. The membership attribute of the document is also defined. It can't be null. Okay? So either the uh, uh, user is a member of the group or not, or the document is a member of the group or not. And then the timestamp, and so you, you can sort of read these yourself. I don't have to walk through them, but basically your membership status has to be defined and your joint timestamps have to be defined. Okay? Both the member and the uh, document have to be enrolled into the group. And then it's possible that you left the group or it's possible that you're still a member of the group. And then there are different conditions that need to be uh, checked on the relative values of these timestamps depending on the particular policy that we are enforcing. So if the policy says you can only read the document if it was made available to the group after your joining, that's what this part is testing. And this part here is saying that, look, after you've left the group, you still retain access to documents that were available to the group during your access. Now, of course, if you change the policy, these predicates will change. But, um, you know, we have a well-defined place to put them. And uh, then we need an uh, ongoing authorization check. So this is one aspect of usage control. You don't do the checking just at the beginning. You also continue to do it during the access. And we need an ongoing authorization check so that if the uh, document is removed from the group, then uh, this uh, condition is uh, uh, basically access is turned off. If I remove the document from the group, access is terminated. If I remove the user from the group, I don't need to terminate the access because this document continues to be accessible because it was created during the period of membership. All right. So you can convince yourself that this policy is correctly stated or not, but the point is that we have the machinery to state the policy of pre-authorization before you start the access, and then ongoing authorization while the access is continuing. The usage control model is designed to handle that. Now, when we move to the enforcement model, our biggest task is to figure out how to approximate this ideal of instant revocation and uh, preemptive revocation, okay? And in order to do that, we are going to present two models. One model is actually not going to allow you any offline access and is going to enforce uh, instant revocation and preemptive revocation as closely as uh, feasible, or, you know, I will uh, show you the specification for that. And then that's not a really practical model. And then the second model is going to show how to do an approximation. So uh, the uh, again, I'm not <coughs> going to show you the enroll, disenroll, and so on. The main point I want to make with respect to this slide is that we have this notion of a member attribute, a joint timestamp, a leave timestamp, and these attributes are available to us on the client machine, but those are not the authoritative values of these attributes. They are like locally cached um, values. The authoritative values of the member attribute, join uh, timestamp, and leave timestamp are available on some uh, server somewhere. Okay? So, because uh, that's the only place where they can be maintained. Uh, since I can't reach out to every laptop in the world and actually try to update the attributes there. All right? The authoritative values are maintained on a server, and local cache values are available on the client, but the enforcement is done with respect to the client, okay? the values on the client. So if I want to do a faithful enforcement before I check these attributes, I have to make sure I have the most up-to-date value. So I have to go out and refresh my cache, all right? And not only do I have to do that at the beginning, while access is going on, I have to continuously do that. Now, what does it mean, continuously do that? Do I do it every machine cycle? Do I do it, you know, I mean, if you think about it as a practical matter, 
and there's a network latency delay, so I'm always a little bit out of date, right? I'm never going to be 100% up to date. That's intrinsic to distributed systems. So we are not going to try and, you know, we're just going to sort of ignore that problem and say, in the model, we are going to say you do it continuously, all right? All right? So uh, just uh, with the understanding, we realize that in practice, when you implement this, you can only approximate it. So the faithful uh, solution I'll show you uh, is uh, basically uh, up. the main difference with respect to this uh, policy statement is that you need to update these values before you do this uh, checking. In uh, Yukon terminology, the requirement to update these values before doing the checking is called an obligation. And it's called a pre-obligation because you have to do it before the access is granted. And you can do that only if there is connectivity. If there is no connectivity, you're not able to do that. So you require the system to be in a state where you can actually complete that update and refresh, okay? So the requirement that there be connectivity is called a condition in the usage control model. The requirement that you do the update is called an obligation. And uh, both of these are needed in order to implement the faithful model. And you need that not only for pre-authorization, you need it during ongoing authorization also. So that's the uh, sort of point that we need the power of uh, uh, usage control. We need, we need the full power of usage control to be able to enforce this. Even the policy looks very simple, but we need the sophistication of the Yukon model to enforce it. The simple-minded access control model is not, access matrix model is not enough for this purpose. Now, when you're doing an approximation, Basically, you cannot afford to update, to refresh your cache every time. Okay, as a practical matter, that's not uh, re uh, reasonable. And yes, the bigger the window of uh, refresh, the less uh, accurate the enforcement of your policy, the bigger your approximation. Okay, so really, you need to uh, sort of uh, update uh, not every time, but every so often, okay? So maybe every 10 times, maybe every 20 times you need to go do an update. And if you're doing an update, let's say every 20 times, every time you do an access, there has to be some countdown, okay? So uh, all of that is required in order to, all of that machinery is required in order to enforce the approximate model. So uh, really, uh, all we have done is to enforce the faithful model, we have to sort of do this refreshing continuously. But to enforce the approximate model, we have to do it periodically and we have to have some criteria for how frequently to do it. And, uh, you know, again, it takes the full machinery of the Yukon model to be able to state this. And that's uh, really uh, part of our insight that, uh, you know, uh, these look like fairly simple, straightforward kinds of policies, but if you think deeply enough about them, to actually enforce them in practice requires you uh, to have the full machinery of the usage control model, okay? So it requires the full uh, power of Yukon. And then uh, the implementation models have to get into the detailed protocols for doing all this. Uh, we obviously don't have uh, time to uh, cover this at all. And uh, just close with these uh, concluding remarks that, uh, uh, you know, trusted computing can work for some aspects of information sharing. Uh, we have shown a fairly simple kind of information sharing here. Uh, how far we can push it, uh, well, that remains uh, a question for further investigation. And then thinking about security problems using uh, this sort of three-layer framework uh, is a possible uh, useful thing that could be done to problems other than information sharing and to security platforms other than trusted computing. And uh, Yukon uh, also is a useful way of... Uh, we need something with that kind of power to realistically uh, model these, uh, these problems. And uh, that's... Uh, I don't know if we have some time for question and answer or... Uh,
kind of taken it down to the limit here, but. Uh, we have time for a couple more. We'll okay. Be they may not go uh, they online. Go yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, my question is, the, the basis of this seems to be that the TPM module really is secure and keeps the keys hidden and things right. like that. If that gets broken, does that kind of destroy the whole system? Yeah, so, you know, there are, yes, so that does destroy the whole system. And uh, there's, there are a couple of ways of answering that uh, concern. Uh, one is, uh, which, which you'll see sort of mentioned in the TPM community a lot, that, okay, we are really trying to pr protect against software-only attacks. We are not trying to protect against uh, hardware attacks and hardware tampering. And if you're doing tampering at the hardware level, there's information in the clear on various system buses and so on. So unless you're going to start encrypting information that's on the system buses on your motherboard, uh, you know, somebody can s just stick a probe in there and pick up some of that information. And is it really realistic for us to start encrypting that stuff? I mean, you know, so they, they, they don't want to even think about that, uh, that level of detail. So uh, you may not need to interfere with the TPM. You may be able to do things by just uh, uh, probes on the motherboard. But the average Joe is not going to do that. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> so that... I said I'll give you two. Uh, I've kind of forgotten the second one that I wanted to mention. So. I'm sorry, I could not some of the things in your slides. I know you cannot get into the other. You cannot. Please elaborate on policy change. Policy change? Well, I talked about policy flexibility. So, really, in any given uh, Yukon specification, you know, you either have to kind of, I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is a uh, language. Uh, okay, so here we have specified a very specific policy. Now, you could put some kind of a case statement and say, if policy is this, here are the checks you need to make. Or if policy is this, here are the checks you need to make. But then you open up the question of where do I get this, uh, how do I determine which policy is in force? So uh, Yukon, per se, was not really designed to be, it was designed to make these kinds of statements for a particular specific policy rather than making the policy a parameter in the enforcement. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but that's the, are, but yeah. In the next slide, you have those layers, right? Let's say, let's, and then we'll have yeah, so, you know, look, my intention is not to present this as a top-down, waterfall-style uh, software engineering kind of thing. You know, this, this is not at all uh, intended to convey that uh, uh, picture. This is more a I mean, my analogy is always to network protocols. So, you know, you have stuff happening at all layers all the time. So uh, this, you probably need to be working at all these layers all the time. If the activity and thinking is concurrent. What this should be able to help you do is to sort of move the questions up and down to the correct layers. So if you are confronting something in the implementation model and you get stuck and you need to fix some policy, because your developers have already gone down a particular path and implemented something and it's too late and too expensive to fix it. Yeah, but you should still bump that up to the policy model layer and reconcile it there and then. So I, I have no expectation that you'll be ab able to actually address any of this in a uh, uh, thinking in only one layer at a time or thinking in a sort of top-down way or a bottom-up way. At the same time, you want to make what you do at each of these layers relatively robust so that if your, implement, if your policy models change, if your policy requirements change at the policy model layer, uh, you can do some small tweaks at the enforcement layer and it will be taken care of. And you can do some small tweaks at the 
implementation layer and it will get taken care of because you can identify the points where policy is being enforced. So that's, that's the hope. It's a modest hope. Oh, there we go. Um, so I'll, I'll just make uh, uh, two observations uh, for you. The, the first is that part of this really needs to be at the implementation level and maybe enforcement as well is, is a threat model um, and yeah. that, that goes to the, the TPM question. Uh, right. The threat model for the standard TPM implementation is the average business user with uh, academic lab, business lab kind of uh, uh, capabilities rather than a governmental entity. Uh, and if you're going to go up against that, you use, you use epoxy with lead and uh, you use other kinds of controls on the, on the chip to protect the buses or on the motherboard to protect the buses. So there is that other element is yes. understanding the threat model. Uh, and the second observation is one of, the, one of the nice things that occurs to me as you were talking about Yukon is uh, that looks like that would be a good model to include uh, data provenance uh, as another aspect of uh, elements with the data. Um, in, in addition to the control. It, do you, any comment to that? Yeah, so my uh, hope is that we would be able to capture those kinds of things as attributes. Uh, you know, attributes can be security levels, clearances, access control lists, um, various timestamps, various usage counts. So I, uh, my, my expectation or my uh, belief is that I should be able to capture that uh, in a suitable uh, attribute to track it. But then it needs to be protected. Yeah, so the, the point is that uh, the attributes in the usage control model are updatable in two ways. One is by direct administrative access. So somebody has the authority to go and uh, in, in, in this example, if, some, if I enroll somebody into a group, uh, then I'm changing their membership attribute to true, okay? So that's a direct, it's sort of an update of an attribute that I'm doing. Uh, so uh, that's one way of doing it. Another way of thinking about it is that I did some operation on that object and as a side effect, things got updated. So I think uh, the latter way of thinking about it actually covers the former. And uh, it uh, also implies some control of authorization over who can uh, do that. But yes, we do need some administrative model uh, aspect to it. So I have not, I've, in, in this particular uh, exercise, we have kind of commingled the uh, administrative model. And I said we have operations to add and uh, to enroll and disenroll a member, add and remove a document. And then we have the crucial operation of a member reading a document, right? So in one sense, that's the real operation that we are concerned about. The other two are administrative operations. And we've commingled them. And there may be some methodology to try to develop them. Um, you know, you may have a different uh, admin model, but your uh, sort of bottom line enforcement of the read operation remains the same. So uh, those are all, you know, our thinking with Yukon is still uh, uh, relatively new. And uh, we've, uh, so far, it seems to be a fairly robust way of thinking about problems. And by the way, one of my uh, challenges is to find, if, if I find things that break Yukon or push it, I'll be very happy. Uh, it's, it, that's a good result because that, uh, you know, then I have to think it through carefully and say, all right, what is missing? What is it that I need to add? And, uh, you know, uh, that will be a, a positive step, not a negative step. So uh, it is a testable claim that this Yukon framework is uh, uh, pretty robust to, to, to cover lots of problems. And if it isn't, then uh, uh, maybe we need a Yukon 1, Yukon 2, some kind of Yukon hierarchy. I can, just like the RBAC hierarchy, we can come up with a, a little diagram. <laughs> So uh, the thinking is still, uh, you know, relatively new. And uh, what we are trying to do is to apply Yukon to a variety of problems. That's our uh, sort of uh, way of testing its robustness. And uh, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much.